what we mean when we say Zen practice in daily life is that we recognize, of course, that our practice has to permeate our whole existence. It's not something that exists only on the cushion. That, that would be useless. So what we're talking about is taking what we have realized or what we are able to sustain from our daily practice and then slowly uh, through the use of various bridges, causing it to go into all of our activities, even ones that seemingly are not practice related. So all of that is, is, is wonderful. And I think everyone knows that that's what we need to do. But it's useless, again, to talk about that unless the formal practice is there as well. So I, I want to say, first of all, what should your formal practice be? That's something between you and your teacher. Uh, if we talk about the sort of traditional ideas of what it should be or what it could be as a lay person, um, we will always say that more is better. More practice is better if it's correct practice. Again, that's between you and your teacher. But as a layperson, uh, at a minimum, some amount of zazen every day. That's the first thing. Some amount, in our lineage at least, we would say, uh, some amount in addition to zazen of what we call internal cultivation or breathing training. Because that is what is also going to go into and transform the depth and the power of the zazen. And then finally, I would say, uh, if you are a lay practitioner, a wonderful, important thing to do is to establish your own butsudan, your own small altar. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I mean, we have traditional guidelines for these things, but a small Buddha statue is enough, or maybe a, a small incense burner. And then every day, in addition to zazen and internal cultivation training, chant. Uh, you can do choka, the full formal formal um, morning recitation that we do in Rinzai Zen. If you like, it takes, you know, once you get quick at it, I always say professional speed. <laughs> it's about, you can do it in 25 minutes, maybe. Uh, maybe in the beginning it takes a little longer than that. We also have an abbreviated home practice. Uh, it is taking refuge, the purification verse, the Heart Sutra, Shosaishu, which is the Durani to remove or prevent misfortune. Dedication of merit, the echo, uh, followed by the four vows and and major kukanon gyo. You can do that practice in ten minutes, and it's a wonderful, concise practice. So, all right. So that's formal practice. Uh, how much zazen is usually the question that comes next from folks. And uh, on the Rinzai Zen Facebook group, which is a hotbed of in intelligent discussion, <laughs> there was a controversial thread uh, a few months ago. Because I said that the traditional idea, it's about two hours a day is ideal. Two hours a day may not be possible for you. Two hours a day of zazen may be possible for you if you're honest with yourself. Uh, it depends on your motivation. It depends on what you're doing with your life, um, how you want to spend your time, and so on. Possible or not possible, that's, that's for you to decide, for you to work with your own conditions. And there's no reason to feel shamed or, or judged. You cannot do that so-called traditional amount. But we say two hours a day is, is ideal because it means likely you have a certain amount of sitting in the morning, we'll say an hour or 45 minutes, maybe two, two periods, 25 minutes each with kinhin in between, walking meditation, for example, in the morning, and then in the evening you find time to do the same. Those provide the two islands of uh, cultivating the samadhi condition, the state of meditative absorption. And because you have those as sort of the poles of your day, uh, it allows you much more easily to start to work on sustaining that condition and the subject of Zen and daily life that we're going to do. I could also say that there is this uh, idea, it's not an idea, it's our experience, but it is traditionally said that the two best times of the day to sit are in the morning, uh, just before dawn, when the light is coming up in the world and the Yin is changing to yang, that energetic shift of the world. Everything is waking up. That is an extraordinarily useful time to sit because of the effect that has on the body. Uh, the other one is, and the other pole, so to speak, is uh, twilight. Okay, after the sun has gone down and the, the light is falling in the world, things are becoming calmer, the, the nighttime insects start to sound and so on. That's a time it's very easy to sort of with your body and mind to sort of follow that energetic shift and go into a profound meditative state. So recognizing that, I would say again, the, the 
to sum up, the foundation of formal practice. Sit as much as you can. If you can sit a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening, fantastic. Those two traditional times are ideal. If you can sit a total of about two hours a day, that's a, that's a nice benchmark. It's not always possible. I know that. But if you can aim for it, why not? Try to. And then on days that you cannot do that, there's no reason to beat yourself up. It's just something we like to try to do. In addition to your sitting practice, five to 10 minutes a day of kind of breath cultivation using the exercises that you can learn is a wonderful way to uh, more quickly, more rapidly deepen your practice because the effects of that will go into Zazen. And then finally, uh, if you have time, chanting. Chanting is a wonderful thing to do. To maintain a small butsudan, to uh, express the devotional side of our practice, um, the, the heartfelt side of dedicating the merit of our practice to others, a very important thing to do, and especially to chant the four vows. I mean, even if you chanted nothing but the four vows three times a day, that would be worth your time to do that. Uh, that makes me remember actually recently on the Facebook group that I mentioned, I said, and I, th I think this caused some surprise for some folks, I said that if I had to give up all Zen practices, the one that I would keep would be Choka, the morning recitation. Even if I had to give up sitting, koan practice, uh, internal cultivation, whatever, if the only practice I could do was chanting every day, that morning recitation, dedication of merit, uh, recognizing my own failings, reaffirming refuge in the four vows, dedicating it all to others, etc. Um, that's a complete practice <laughs> by itself. You would not be behind. So, so that's that's uh, just as a, a, a caveat in the beginning. We have to have some kind of formal practice in the beginning. To talk about practice in daily life. Now, to the main subject. There's a kind of view, or I could call it a kind of approach a way of um, setting our attitude towards our lives that is really going to uh, be the additional foundation for Zen practice in daily life. And we have two words in Japanese that we use for this. Uh, the first word is shugyo, the second word is kufu. I like to talk about these words just a little bit. Shugyo, uh, it, it, it's you know, there are a number of words in Japanese we use for training or practice. Um, kufu, keiko, tanren, kunren. Each of these words has a kind of slightly different meaning or, or connotation. For example, tanren means forging. So there's some aspects of practice, but there's a repetitive sort of energetic aspect that we could use that word for. Um, keiko, the meaning has the, or that word has the meaning of catching the feeling or the spirit of something ancient. We use that word uh, actually a lot in martial arts training too, when we practice the old forms, kata, for example, we call that kata keiko, catching the, the principle of the old ways of moving transmitted through the forms. Of all those words uh, that we use for training, shugyo is probably the most profound. Um, we have defined it this way. I don't know where I got this definition from. I think probably from one of the teachers in our lineage used to say this. Uh, define Shogyo this way. The deepest possible physical and spiritual training. The deepest possible psychophysical training. We don't differentiate so much between body and mind, as you know, in practice. Uh, we talk about body-mind with a hyphen <laughs> more, more often. But the deepest possible training of that. What is Shugyo in terms of our view or our attitude toward life? Or how do we approach life as Shugyo? That's the important question. One of my teachers, um, Toyota Sensei, described it this way. Modern people, maybe not just modern people, but human beings in general, tend to blame conditions, other people, the times that they live in, culture, um, anything you can think of or anything that makes them uncomfortable, anything that makes them feel less than confident or fearful, anything that makes them feel unhappy. Uh, they tend to look for or seize upon something external to blame. 
and not shall we say the conditions. He said Shugyo is exactly the opposite. The view or the attitude of a practitioner or Shugyo Sha, which is another name for a Zen practitioner, a Shugyo person, is that anything that makes me uncomfortable, anything that makes me fearful, anything that I am not good at, anything that reveals my weaknesses, um, my instability, my moral failings, anything like that, that I encounter, whenever I feel that way, I look immediately and I say, what do I need to work on? That, in a nutshell, is shugyo. Now, shugyo does not mean that if uh, you know I feel uncomfortable about something because someone is doing something inappropriate, that I shouldn't address that. It doesn't mean we accept injustice. We, we have to work with and deal with conditions, of course. But the fundamental attitude of the practitioner is that all of those things are the mirror for my own existence, my own character, my own functioning. And they reveal the weaknesses in that. Because of that, they're a gift. The people who uh, make me most uncomfortable or annoy me the most are the, the bodhisattvas who are giving me the gift of that mirror. That's how we approach our encounter with conditions, with people, with circumstances. That makes us feel you know, less than ideal. So then practice in daily life has to take that as its fundamental approach. It means that we start to view the entire world and everything in it, all the people in it, all the conditions that we encounter as an opportunity, as a laboratory to, to test myself, as this uh, amazing um, chance to refine myself and to, you know, by identifying those weak spots, uh, weak points, start to change them, start to transform them. Um, what we say, uh, you know, there's another famous Zen saying, you, know, you may have heard this one, Jikishin Kore Dojo. Jikishin Kore Dojo. Jikishin means the correct mind, straightforward, correct mind, or, you know, mind, heart. Kore, here, or there, is the dojo. The dojo is the correct mind. So we don't view a dojo as a building or a place. Dojo means training for right? Of course, we have such places. But if we take that attitude that life is shugyo, everything I encounter is training, everything I encounter is an opportunity and a mirror and a chance to transform, that is the so-called correct mind, jikishin. And when we have that, then the dojo is we don't need to go in this special. That's a very important, I would almost say radical way of going through life. Uh, you know, radical is a word that is no longer radical. It gets overused a lot these days. But I would say that uh, to go through life refusing to blame, but using every circumstance as a chance to refine and to uncover my own weaknesses my lack of compassion, my lack of clarity, my lack of psychophysical strength, whatever it may be. Um, that's really against the stream, so to speak, of the way most people live. And I think if you can set that attitude up as a foundation of your practice, you're almost 99% there in terms of so-called Zen practice in daily life. If, if you make every circumstance, every meeting, every email, every uh, step, every movement of your body reveals something. If you start to take that mindset and set up your mindfulness uh, in a very vigilant manner to observe, observe constantly, what am I experiencing as I encounter all of these different conditions and how skillful is that? And how compassionate is that and so on? Without judging, because it's really not about you ultimately anyway. Uh, if you can do that, then I don't know how we could say you depart from Zen practice. I think in that way, you are automatically, deeply doing Zen practice in daily life. That is true. So, I hope that's clear. Um, I might be rambling more than usual because of my fatigue, but I, I'm very passionate about this subject, so I hope that's coming out a little bit. The great gift I got from my teachers wasn't practice methods, although those are precious. But I think it was understanding how to live 
that way. How to use the circumstances. And, you know, we say in training, uh, if the practitioner is like a blade that we're trying to forge and then sharpen and make, it, make like a razor. I guess a lot of people, their approach to life is like this and life wants them. But the approach of Shugyo is to find that attitude or that angle where whatever you encounter, it's we're still grinding you. I'm not saying it's pleasant, but we can use that situation. And whatever we encounter, no matter how horrible, somehow still could benefit. So that was the great gift I got from my teachers and observing them living that way, even through some of the circumstances they faced in their life, like disease or just one of them death. Um, I was continuously inspired by how they were Shugyo people, no matter what presented itself to them. The other word I mentioned besides Shugyo is Kufu. And this word comes up a lot in Rinzai Zen, especially when we talk about koan practice, because the koan practice itself is called koan kufu. Kufu is a hard word to translate, but it has the feeling of creatively grappling or working with something. Um, not in the sense of grapp grappling, not in the sense of struggling and exhausting oneself, although that is part of kufu too, or can be. But the creativity aspect of it, the almost like a problem solving kind of feeling, but with one's whole body, with one, all of one's energy engaged. So I, I like to use the word grappling or wrestling with something, with one's whole body mind. That's kufu. And that is the, when you learn that quality from koan practice, it's one of the amazing things that koan practice gives us. It's the way to do shugyo. In other words, if shugyo is this kind of attitude of using conditions rather than blaming them and treating the whole world as my training hall, kufu is the way we do that training. It's the, the creative problem solving that happens when we meet difficult conditions. Koan training really gives us that, that capacity. And what it means is ultimately we don't view any circumstance, even the most horrible ones, as so-called bad. We view them as something to be solved, something or something to be worked with. Sometimes uh, solve is not the right word. Sometimes accord with is all we can do. Not fixate is all we can do. But that, that ability to, to intuitively see through situations and creatively adapt to and work with them, that is the part of the fundamental attitude or approach of the Zen practitioner. So not doing justice to the word Khufu here, but I'd, I'd like to move on from there. Um, those two words, I, I really like you to remember them because they're so important. Shugyo and Khufu. They're words that don't have really adequate English translations. Now we can call Shugyo training, but it doesn't, it doesn't plumb the depths of it. Uh, Khufu. You can call it creative problem solving, but it's something much more whole being than that. So shugyo, kufu, it's what Zen practitioners do. And I think in your own training, if you're not clear what those words really mean, you will be. You definitely will be if your training is rightly directed and you go deeply into it. But what we call Zen practitioners, uh, even in some of the recitation we do on a daily basis in the monastery, we don't call them... I don't know, Zen people. We call them Shugyosha, Shugyo people. So very, very interesting words. Maybe you can also research that and see how they're used. I could stop there if there are any questions or any comments at this point, this moment. Anything pressing anyone wants to say or ask? No. Yes, good evening. Um, thank you for your presentation and your commitment to doing these talks. Um, could you just type in the chat the correct spelling for some of these terminologies so that we can look them up in our own time? Like the, a, the Jikin, yeah. Jikin, Jikin, Jikin Kore Dojo, etc. Great idea. I'm doing it right now. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Jikin Kore Dojo actually 
is a uh, kind of a famous thing for people to brush. You can find calligraphies of that fairly fairly commonly. So it's a good it's a good one to know. You may start to recognize it if you see scrolls, <laughs> for example. Okay. So let's talk more concretely in terms of what, you, what your practice actually is. If you have this foundation of formal daily practice, and again, we have to always specify that the practice should be rightly directed. Rightly directed means that you're doing it with guidance from someone and that you're doing it uh, or that they are prescribing practice for you in a manner which is appropriate for you. Um, Self-guiding practice is a difficult thing to do. It's, it's not something we recognize in the Zen tradition as possible for most people. Um, I think Bodhidharma, uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but uh, something like a one in a million person can arrive at awakening and train themselves. If you're not one of those people, you need to find a teacher. And that's the case for most of us, certainly it was the case for me. But when that practice starts to come to some fruition, now we talk about how do we bring this concretely into daily activities? What happens the moment I get up from the cushion? That's one thing, for example. The Zendo uh, training teaches us this because we have this wonderful practice called Kinghin, walking meditation. And I guess, um, as I did for many years, especially when I was a beginner, uh, more of a beginner, I viewed Kinhin with great appreciation as the time you get to stretch your legs, <laughs> you get to refresh your body so that you can sit again, or it's a break in other words. Yeah. But you start to realize pretty quickly that if you're approaching Kinhin correctly, oh, looks like I, I was muted. Did you catch me there? We can hear you now. Andre, yeah. yes. okay, you can, you can hear me okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, I got to notice that I was muted. Did, did I say something horrible? You wanted to shut me up? No, not at all. I don't know what happened. There. <laughs> sorry. No problem. Um, what I was saying is we learned, what we learned from Kin Hin is that it's this amazing opportunity, what Kin Hin is walking meditation, to start to learn how to integrate the meditative condition in the most simple activity, which is walking. So the first suggestion I have, talking practically now, uh, about how to put your training into daily life is when you're sitting, whatever you're experiencing in your sitting, or I should say when you start to experience some basic stability, clarity, one-pointedness in your sitting, and the time comes to end the sit, you're sitting on your own, maybe you have a, you know alarm that goes off or something like that. Stop for a moment before you stand up. Don't jump up. But when it's time to stand up, do so very slowly and with great attention to your condition. Start to see if the simple act of standing up uh, or during that simple act, if you're able to maintain the meditative condition that you had while you were sitting. If you can do it while you're standing up, maybe you stand up into and then you start to take a few steps. In the Rinzai style, we usually walk pretty quickly, yeah. but in the beginning, it's, it's okay. Practice taking just a few steps very slowly. Can you sustain that meditative condition through that process of standing up and taking four or five steps? It sounds not so difficult. It's amazingly difficult. Uh, it's like breath counting. When you when you learn the Susoku Kan, the breath counting method, you learn pretty quickly. I can't even get to two <laughs> without some kind of uh, you know, wandering thought or something arising. It's quite the same with this. But it, but the Kinhin is this amazing first bridge that we use to start to learn how to do it. So that process of standing up, you know, people usually jump up, but if you're practicing on your own, take your time, stand up slowly. Keep your vision spread out in the manner that we do in our training. Keep your breath centered in the hara in the way that we do in our training. And take four or five steps and do kin kin. And if you can eventually start to understand how to hold that condition during kin kin seamlessly until you then sit down for the next sit, 
that's where you're going to learn everything. It's an amazing, amazing practice. So that's my first advice is, is please view Kin Hin not as a break. Not a, it, is a, it is a way to refresh your body. I mean, that's true. But thus, to extend the meditative condition seamlessly through the training of Kin Hin and into the second sit is so incredibly important. It's so foundational to our Zendo training. I would like, especially lay folks, to, to pay more attention to it. Even to the point that, you know, after you've been sitting for some time, even if you're not sitting for a great period of time, maybe you're sitting for a half hour. I mean, I mean half hour is fine. It's a respectable period of time. But uh, maybe that's your only plan to sit, is just to sit for a half hour, then go about your business. Even better than that, sit for two periods of 20 minutes with five minutes can hit in the middle. Just extend it and add that practice in the middle. And that's going to be something that really helps you a great deal. The next thing to do is that after you finish sitting, you know, King Hin teaches you how to do this. Stand up and then go perform a very simple task or a task that you can do without a great deal of uh, conceptual proliferation. Uh, go pour yourself a cup of coffee and slowly drink it or make tea and slowly drink it. And can you sustain the meditative condition? In, first of all, in those physical movements, which means now we're looking at posture and breathing still. We're making sure that when I go to pour the coffee, I'm not introducing aberrations into my body. I'm keeping everything relaxed and the breath where it should be. So our movement itself starts to become meditative in a sense. And you pour the cup of coffee. Coffee is what I drink anyway. And you sip it and you attend to the flavor without judging it. You, you, you maintain that thread through an activity which you usually do mindlessly. Very prosaic activity. But the, that activity involves movement. involves some basic level of thought. You know, you have to get the mug, make the coffee, whatever. It involves the sensory stimulation of the flavor and the swallowing. Um, eating and drinking are activities that are often ones in which we fixate very strongly, you know, judging the flavor is a good, bad, that kind of thing. So you have this amazing opportunity, this very simple activity to maintain a one-pointed, non-abiding state of clarity through action. So those are two suggestions in the beginning. Uh, right from the beginning, you can add kin hin, walking meditation, and you can add a simple activity into your daily schedule, especially if there's, if there's an activity you're gonna do anyway, like make coffee, um, those of you who've done monastic training or session know that samu, physical labor, is an important practice. We don't view it as just work, but we view it as meditative praxis because the action of, for example, sweeping or hoeing the garden, uh, uh, cleaning the floor with the rags, uh, those simple repetitive activities but that involve our whole body in movement rather than stillness are just incredible opportunities to see if we can sustain the meditative state. So I hope that all makes sense. We're talking about samadhi. Samadhi is a state of meditative absorption. Um, people often ask what samadhi is. It's not something mysterious. Um, it's not a state of trance, although there are types and depths of samadhi which have that kind of uh, flavor. But in the, in the most useful and, and, and simplest way, we can say the samadhi is the state of clarity in which the mind does not fixate on anything. It's, it's, not, it's not a static stillness. It's a, a free movement. The image often used is a, a ball or a, a gourd, something hollow that floats thrown into a rapids. And as it goes downstream, even if it hits a rock, it doesn't stick. It goes around. It, it can flow with any conditions. So we, we are... Cultivating that state of mind in zazen, breath counting, for example, to learn ultimately not to fixate on the arising of anything in mind or body. And we learn to maintain or sustain a state of clarity. But then, when you stand up to do walking meditation or to go make a cup of coffee or to go do the physical labor, you find out right away how hard it is to hold that and how much the mind wants to stop on or fixate on everything and anything. Not just thoughts, of course, but uh, you know, so-called exterior objects 
the minute I reach for my coffee mug, I've got a few mugs in the cabinet, I start to give rise to kind of judging. I like that mug. I don't like that mug. <laughs> I mean, it's as simple as that. Suddenly the mind stops. Or the minute I taste the coffee, oh, this coffee is shit, or this coffee is really good. At that moment, the, I lose the state of clarity. So it's so humbling when we start to talk about Zen in daily life. We realize that we are not, even though we call ourselves Zen people, we are not Zen people at all for most of the day. But until you start to work with that, again, the kufu of working with those simple daily activities, you won't be able to transform that. So physical labor is a great one. Um, sweeping, I always love sweeping. Something about that movement, I could put the whole body into it. And even the sound of the, the broom on the, on the floor, something about it uh, really, really useful for me. You may find something like that that works really well. For you. Um, when we start to work with trying to sustain this is samadhi condition, you know, samadhi is not itself awakening, but samadhi is what removes the obstructions to awakening. And samadhi ultimately also is what allows us to uh, sustain the face of awakening in all of our activities or to have it permeate our body. So samadhi is a very important thing to grasp and to start to cultivate. Uh, when we start to do this, we understand that the most effective way to do it and the most effective activities to use for that in daily life are generally going to be physical activities. It's not as easy in the beginning to sustain the samadhi condition through an activity which is quite conceptual, like reading, for example, or listening to someone speak. We can. We must learn to do that too. But in the beginning, something that really uses the whole body and mind in a unified way is going to be the most useful approach. Uh, so another sort of saying that I'd like you to think about uh, we often say that Zen is accomplished through the body. It's not a primarily psychological activity. It's certainly not a primarily intellectual activity. The reason that Zen training is so powerful is because it's psychophysical. It harnesses our whole existence. That's how we cultivate samadhi, using the breath, the body, the mind in unity. So what this means practically for Zen and daily life is as you're going through your daily activities, and what becomes the anchor for you, the, the sort of focus of your mindfulness as you go through your day is this uh, practice of constantly cultivating or constantly being aware of breath and posture. That's a saying I'd like you to remember. Constantly refine breath and posture. What those few words point out is kind of the structure that starts to go through your day in all activities of how to start to sustain the state of clarity in Samadhi. And I start to think here of uh, even activities like working at a computer. Um, I did a video on this not too long ago by popular demand because it's, it's such a relevant topic for folks. But how do we work on our Zen training when we have to sit at a keyboard, for example, and, and engage with that stuff? We can look at it from the standpoint of how we're using our body. Um, there's a way to hold the posture which enables us to remain more clear. And there's a way to cult cultivate the breathing we learn in our training, which we have to ultimately make seamless and constant even when we're doing very non-physical activities like typing on a computer. So again, uh, during your daily life, you set up your mindfulness, you set up your awareness in such a way that you're just gently, constantly observing, how am I using this body? Uh, you know, my keyboard is here in such a way that it puts tension in my body. I have to notice that. And then I may change it by changing where the keyboard is. We start to adjust and move things in such a way that it supports this mind-body usage. No different from Zazen, but now in all of the, the mundane activities that we do all day long. Um, I always use the example of when people reach out to, you know, for a glass of water or something like that. You can tell a Zen trainee from not only how they reach for a glass of water and bring it to their mouths, but also where they put the glass down <laughs> when they're done drinking. Do they place it in a place that is easily reached and allows them to maintain the relaxation and the bodily unity of raising the glass up with one's whole body? If you, I don't know, <laughs> 
we've done this kind of stuff before. So I don't know if you can see. If you, if I raise this coffee cup up only with my arm, I have tension in the body. And that will not be a way of moving that supports the cultivation of samadhi. But if when I reach for the coffee cup, there's a subtle reaching with the whole body. I will never reach for it just with the arm. I reach with the whole posture. It means from the earth, the whole frame in an integrated way is reaching. Well, because I reach my arm out, my center of gravity has to shift, so I allow it to do so. Now I feel like I'm one with this cup. I cannot tell where the cup starts or ends. Whereas if I reach for it in a less efficient way, I have a more dualistic feeling of I'm reaching for a cup. So again, in daily life, constantly refining breath and posture means looking at the smallest movements and activities. Am I reaching for the coffee cup with my whole being and body? And now as I raise it to my mouth, do I introduce tension by splitting my arm off from the rest of my body? Or do I do it in a way that supports the whole body integration? I mean, th these are the, the minutia that we start to look at. If you ask me to sum up Zen training and daily life, the one way I would say it is what I did say, constantly refine breath and posture. The other way I would say it is attend to everything. There is no physical movement that is unimportant or that is not part of this training. I did a video on, uh, on my Patreon page, um, how to brush your teeth, <laughs> as I said, training. And people brush their teeth in a way, you know, I don't, I don't care how they're training themselves all day long. Their, their way of movement is so graceful and perfect and unified. And then they go to brush their teeth and they do this. And they put the tension back into the body and they lose that condition of clarity. But there's a way to brush your teeth. When you raise the toothbrush up, we pay attention to that minutia of stuff. And I would also say sometimes you brush your teeth with the other hand so you can balance the nervous system. If you're right-handed dominant, balance it. Ch change which side the computer mouse is on. That's part of Zen training in daily life. You start to look at how to, again, refine posture and breath ceaselessly, endlessly, the smallest activity, because that is what creates the skeleton that the samadhi condition can be the flesh around through the day. I don't know if that makes sense unless you have experience of that, but I would just encourage you to start to look at the smallest movements that you do, how you're sitting now, how you will move when you get up after this presentation is done, or whatever you do next, even something as simple as reaching for a mug. Are you doing it with your whole being in a unified way that supports the one-pointed clarity of Zen? Or are you subtly sabotaging your sitting practice by losing the principles of it as you do those daily activities? And again, the, the activities that can really teach you this, Kin Hin, the bridge from sitting into movement, simple physical activities or physical labor, sweeping, anything where you use the whole body in a gentle, unified way, fantastic. Of course, those of you who do other arts, uh, things like martial arts or fine arts, like tea, for example, we can see from the movement of the person if they're doing it with their whole existence or if something is left out, something is split. That's why those activities are so amazing and valuable too. So I've been talking for about 45 minutes. Um, I hope I hope I'm not completely unclear. As I mentioned, I'm a little cloudy tonight because of fatigue, but um, this topic is so amazing. What I want you to get from it is that um, it's, I know that it can sound daunting. I'm talking about observing and attending to the minutia of everything you do every moment of your existence. But it's not daunting and it's not exhausting. It's amazing. It's, it's nothing is boring anymore. <laughs> Everything becomes this amazing laboratory where I start to feel the same condition as I have when I'm on the cushion in the profound state of meditation. That starts to flower and blossom 
in the movements of brushing my teeth or bringing chopsticks to my mouth or sweeping the floor or talking to someone, uh, you start to feel that that's coming alive. And as I said, as a shugyosha, even the really difficult situations, emotional loss, sickness, um, reading the news, I mean, anything that, that just makes us feel horrible, somehow we start to feel also the joyfulness of, oh, this is an opportunity. And how is my body and how are my body and mind functioning in this? How can I use this situation, the emotional impact of this, this person who's difficult, this illness in my body, whatever, to support uh, my, my, my fundamental way of addressing life or, or approaching life as opportunity, as a grindstone to sharpen rather than blunt. And again, within that, every single activity, how am I using my posture? How am I using my breathing? That will be the practical uh, uh, approach that actually supports the Samadhi condition. Our uh, practice, as I often like to lecture, is um, you know, to, to, to people's great annoyance, I'm sure, sometimes, because I never stop talking about it. But what we're doing is a yogic practice. It's a, it comes from the yogic stream of spirituality. It means that this is our vehicle for realization. We don't have a split of spirit and matter. We don't have a split of mind and body, practically speaking, in our practice. We're using all of them in a unified way. That's what Zazen is meant to teach us. So if you can start to look at every single small activity as an opportunity to sustain that, Look at how the different ways of using your body in the simplest activities of brushing your teeth, for example, change this experience, the way of experiencing. And again, based on the foundation of your formal daily practice and this approach or this view of life as an opportunity, as a dojo, life is the amazing laboratory, the amazing training hall where everything that presents itself to me as conditions, whether they're so-called inner or outer, are remarkable energetic waves to accord with and to, to surf rather than to be crushed upon. Um, we don't have to worry about Zen practice in daily life. Then there'll be a, a moment where you will not be able to say that there's a difference between sitting and activity. That is an amazing wonderful place to arrive at. So I wish that for everyone. And I hope something in this talk uh, gave you some clues on how to do that. Um, just to harp again on the practical stuff, again, constantly refine breath and posture. King Hin, so important. Please don't overlook King Hin, walking meditation as the uh, training tool that it is rather than just a break for your legs. And simple physical activities, I use the example of, uh, you know, getting up from sitting and making a cup of coffee, whatever works for you, find something like that that you can then use as a bridge to learn how to bring the zazen condition into every moment of your life. And then when you really want to challenge yourself and you think you've mastered all of this, then start to deal with people. And uh, then also, I was joking with Andre, one of my teachers said, if you really want to do intense shugyo, kufu, Zen training, uh, get married and have children. Which I have not done, so I'm not a master. <laughs> no kids. <laughs> I think that's all I wanted to say at this point. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, why don't we open it up for a discussion and questions about anything. It can be about what I talked about. If there's anything else you'd like to ask, I'm happy to talk. Yes, Hashim. Hello. First, thank you very much for this wonderful and very clear talk. I mean, it's midnight where I live. I think it's worth it. Thank you very much. It was perfect. Uh, the thank, thing you. That I, thank you. The thing that I want to share and ask you is I've been practicing for a long time by myself. In the, in the beginning, I had a Sangha. But the, the thing 
that the teachers didn't tell was what happens after the zazen. Always the teachers, they talk about how to breathe, how to sit properly. And that was something I always tried to search. And I couldn't actually find an answer for a long time because everyone talked about zazen and koans. And, and at the end, I found an answer from, uh, I don't wanna, uh, I don't wanna exaggerate any, any uh, lineage, but I found something from Thich Nhat Hanh, which talks about mindfulness, nonstop. But as I, as I got deeper, I found out that uh, his way of mindfulness was coming from the Theravada tradition, from Sati. I don't know, maybe this, uh, this seems a little bit confusing. I just want to ask, uh, uh, could we integrate that uh, mindfulness practice to our Zen practice, even if it's from the Theravada tradition? Sure, there's no conflict at all. The, the meaning is the same. And when, when we talk about mindfulness in terms of practice, what we mean simply is that we recollect or we remember to return again and again to the method. I mean, that's the most basic practical way to describe our experience of mindfulness in terms of something like Zazen. Uh, but we have in Zen our own expression also of, of, for example, what Zazen means really in the, in the deepest sense beyond our transcending whatever so-called method you're using. Um, it would be a lecture in and of itself, but I recommend for you to read the Platform Sutra, the Six Patriarchs record. He describes very clearly what we really mean when we use the word zazen, uh, not limited to this act of sitting on a cushion. I think if you read that, you would find no conflict between that and what you read or experienced from Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, but if you're asking if it's okay to integrate, the practices from different traditions like that, I would say the answer I would give immediately is you should ask your teacher. If you don't have a teacher, I don't think that there will be any conflict between what you are describing and what we do in Zen training. How could there be? I mean, Buddha Dharma is Buddha Dharma. What's important is we, we follow a coherent path of practice but especially if you're talking about Thich Nhat Hanh, I see I would see no conflict at all. But read the Platform Sutra because um, I'm a Zen guy, so I have to plug that. <laughs> Thank you. That's man. okay. So that is it okay answer for you? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question from Shika. You know, nice to see you. My question is, um, uh, so on la this past week on Sunday, I um, went to this uh, event, this online event uh, between this uh, Tibetan Lama, uh, Lama Willa Baker, and her guest, Lama Paulden uh, Jolma. And the latter, I just found within a couple of minutes of just listening to her, I felt like I, w I really want this woman to be my teacher. And um, and so I, I don't, I don't know if she's well. I, I think she retired from or stepped back from teaching, um, but she does something like spiritual counseling. But it, it, you know, it, this is it. It costs money and stuff like that. And she's in London. She's not here, you know. And it's there are all these practical things. Um, and I've, I've been embedded in my school for a while, and I don't know if it's, it makes sense to. Um, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I don't know if it makes sense. If it makes sense to explore another teacher, you mean? Yeah, just uh, to really throw myself into it. Well, if you have an existing relationship with a teacher, that's one person you should talk to about it. And then mm -hmm. the second person you should talk to about it is the person that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And I would say, so those, those two lines of communication need to be honest and clear. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, uh, there's nothing to be, uh, there's nothing wrong with, there's no harm done by as soon as you can going to meet the person you're interested in, or at least having some kind of conversation with them. 
to, to explore that. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you have a person that you view as your current teacher, I say this for everyone, uh, then you owe it to that person also to apprise them of what you're thinking and to get their input on it because you've already entered into that relationship of honesty and communication and trust with them. So it's important to honor that. If it's time to sever that relationship, then do it do it in the correct way. I think that that's an important thing to consider. It's, you know, we get hung up on teacher-student relationship stuff sometimes because in our own minds we build it up to be special, but to me it's no different than any successful human relationship. Honesty, communication, you know, open lines of communication, and uh, you know, saying what's on your mind, just, just being clear with each other, caretaking for each other. You know, that teacher-student relationship is two ways. You may feel you have some obligation to the teacher, but the teacher also feels an obligation to you. So honor that and let them fulfill that also by letting them know what you're thinking. Mm. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Um, it makes sense. I, I, yeah, I, I have to figure out a way to, to, to say it in a, in a way that doesn't, you know, diminish my uh, gratitude for her for my teacher now. Yeah, that's, that's a nice way to put it. And that's Khufu. That's creative mm -hmm. problem solving. <laughs> that's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good luck with that. Simon, go for it. Thank you very much. This was really wonderful. Uh, a lot of insights in this talk, so thank you. Um, you, I was just wondering. I was just wondering if you could speak on, um, with the constant observation of how you're performing things and going through your daily life, um, and looking at the minutia. Um, is there a way you could uh, address, you know, not getting too fixated, or especially for people who are really, really perfectionist, um, and not getting too, yeah, really, really fixated on on that sort of thing and how I'm performing tasks in almost in a robotic sort of way. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. No, it, it makes complete sense. And it sounds paradoxical because we're trying to cultivate the mind which does not fixate. And yet it sounds as if the training is to fixate on everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I believe I used the word observation, you know, constantly watching or observing, but it's probably not as skillful a word as I would like to use because, and this is a problem in practice in general, we, I've talked about this, especially in terms of something like breath counting. It's very common for people to, or any practice that people are doing, it's very common for people to set up the practice and to be attending to it, and then to have a piece of their mind split off and watch themselves practice. Mm -hmm. And usually that, that, you know, that can be a slightly narcissistic part of mind, or it can be a judging and shaming part of mind, you know, mm -hmm. you suck. Or, oh, that was great. You know, it's, and we don't need to judge the fact that we're judging either and just spin it off endlessly. It's just, we recognize that it's a part of the mind which is not engaged in the practice. So we pull it back in. And that, that process again and again is something that we engage in. That's what we call mindfulness. Um, rather than observation, I guess, when I talk about attending to or, or um, you know, working with the constantly changing conditions and the minutia of every movement and so on. It's more the quality of throwing oneself, body and mind completely into it. Now, of course, we're cultivating a form and relaxation and breathing. The, the, all of these things take time to unify. Um, we can be attending to our breathing, for example, and then we forget to keep the body relaxed. It's like when you learn to ride a bicycle and the first time and you concentrate on the pedals and you forget the handlebars or something like that. Right? But eventually it all starts to function. Then once that starts to function, something simple like, you know, brushing your teeth, it's not so much that we're obsessively fixating on every small movement, but it's more that within the vessel or the form of, of correct usage of body mind, I'm throwing myself into that seemingly mundane activity with my whole existence. So brushing the teeth becomes the universe. The toothbrush is not separate from my body. My body is not separate from the room. We start to have that kind of experience. Just, uh, I guess I, I use the word attending to, but attending to me means becoming, throwing yourself completely into 
even the smallest thing. In the beginning, I guess, you know, if I'm paying attention to how I pick up the coffee cup, like I described, yeah, there is a stage where it's a little fixated or you're learning the form, so to speak. But once the form is embodied and I understand how to unify myself with the mug so that it, that simple act becomes an act of training, then that's where it becomes so amazingly uh, pleasant to encompass everything in practice because that simple act of drinking coffee is something I'm doing with my whole being and it feels it feels remarkable, remarkable to do so. No, no difference between that and completely counting the breath or completely breathing the colon or doing anything else in my life. There, I, I cannot differentiate that simple act from what I do in Zazen. So Zazen is in stillness, so it's easy to, easier to learn that quality there. But now we have the challenge of putting it into movement. So we have to look at how the body is being used, how the breath is being used and all of that. Uh, yeah, in the beginning, it can seem like fixation. We have to be aware of that part of the mind that wants to split off and watch us do it. But in general, I, I, I want to speak more in terms of throwing yourself body and mind into every moment's activity as if it were your last act on earth or, you know, joyously the the spirit of Zen training has been described as like a warrior charging on a horse with his sword held high into alone into 10,000 enemies. Yeah, it's a, that's a interesting image. It's not about conflict or war or fighting, but it's that spirit of complete abandon and, and almost joyous. Uh, just this exists. Just this is what I'm doing with my whole being. Yeah, that so, makes you know, a lot of sense. Yeah. Walk around more like this from time to time if it helps you. <laughs> <laughs> more of a full engagement rather than a real sort of nitpicky, but it's more of a yeah, fullness yeah. of engagement. Yeah. And, and any activity in your life where you've experienced that athletics, love, art, we, we have, a, you know, I often joke that people can sit and watch a movie on, that they're really into unmoving for two hours, just wrapped. But then they complain that a half hour zazen, it's hard to sit still. You know, we can do it. We know how to do it. <laughs> so if we, if we remember those times and put that same spirit into the, all of our activities, then it all becomes as amazing as that movie. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a quest, well, three questions coming. Uh, how are you on time, Meido? We are, it's already oh, five. Uh, to, to, to me, it's to me, it's eight hours later. I don't care. I'm fine. Awesome, awesome. All right, uh, <laughs> let's go one by one. Then first, Asil. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Maida, thanks a lot for your um, uh, for your talk. Uh, I have a couple of clarifying questions. Um, first, uh, can you please explain again what's a sort of benefit or purpose behind uh, putting your full mind in every activity, like? What we're, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I understand that we're trying to cultivate uh, samadhi conditioning in all our activities, but what's a, like an ultimate goal of doing that? And also, uh, it seems like apart from your body breath, there are also other elements like sounds, external, internal, also body sensations. And it's kind of hard to, uh, to sort of unify all of them and put it into activity. So is there a more like a progressive way where you start with couple of elements or combination of some of them and then gradually grow to the full or you have to just try to do it um, with all the elements um, from a beginning. Um, so yeah, those two questions. Okay. Those two questions are a whole lecture. <laughs> that, would be, that would be a great lecture. We could talk about the senses, for example. When, when we talk about the body-mind, we're talking also about the senses, how we use the senses. And I would say in the beginning, we pay great attention to how we specifically use some of those senses. So um, uh, as I have taught in almost every inner craft course or any instruction anyone has seen me do, a um, very important way that we enter that gate is by looking at how we use the eyes during Zazen, for example, and the effect that that has on our way of experiencing. But really, Samadhi means we're developing the non-abiding or the non-fixating quality of the mind, which is using all of those senses and experiencing this body. Uh, so in a sense, we don't have to over fixate on individual senses. We can understand 
how to let them all function naturally without fixating on any one of them. It, it, it's a it's a more natural or organic process, I think. Uh, even if in the beginning we pay great attention to, again, the minutia of how to use, for example, the eyes. Uh, so I don't. I, does that answer your second question a little bit? Yeah. So, so you're answering the question of why we are cultivating the natural way of doing things. Yeah. I mean, you you, you know you mentioned the senses. I just want to stress that it's not that we're jumping around to the different senses and examining each of them. Mm -hmm. But we learn to let them all function naturally. And, and again, this word non-abiding is a very important one. Um, we can start to flow with the experience or the conditions without sticking to any of them. That includes how all of the senses are functioning. Even the line between you know, what I often experience as my inner world and the outer world, that line starts to become more permeable and drop away. So within that, where are my senses? Where's my body? Where's my mind? We start to feel that those things are not so rigid as we had originally experienced. So a lot of those kind of questions of practice sort of self-resolve. They resolve themselves within the experiential aspect of the practice. Um, the reason samadhi is so important, again, samadhi, there are different types of samadhi, different depths of samadhi. It's, it's, a, it's a profound subject. But we can say that the samadhi that we value in Zen is that quality of non-abiding. Because from the Buddhist standpoint, what we call delusion, or bono, klesha, is the moment that the mind fixates, stops. And the biggest fixation, of course, is the fixation upon the false sense of this I, or fixation upon the kind of subject-object way of experiencing. As soon as I fixate upon an object which is separate from me, then we have that split. Right? So that quality of fixating or stopping Object of desire, object of aversion, object which is I or not I. That is the kind of the, the root that we strike at with this cultivation of non-abiding, non-fixing. Uh, Takwan, the great Zen master Takwan Soho wrote about this. I've mentioned this text before, Furochi Shimyoroku. Um, I can write it in the chat too. You can, you can find it in various places in translation. It's, he talks about it from the standpoint of various things, one of which is martial arts. Uh, if a bunch of people are attacking at the same time with swords and your mind fixates on one of them, even though your technique is perfect, the next one gets you. So what we call the Vedan Zen isn't the mind which is static and still, but it's the mind that can flow. It's what I've been talking about. Right? That quality, even if we cultivate it very profoundly, is not itself awakening, but it's starts to dissolve the habitual delusion or, or helps us to start to see through it. Uh, we say that it starts to dissolve the obstructions to awakening. So right from the beginning of our Zen practice with something like Susokokan, we're starting to cultivate that or to bring that to fruition. When we do have the clear arising of the knowledge or experiential knowledge we call Kensho or awakening, Samadhi then becomes the way that we integrate that, or I should say that the the, the sort of seamless uh, sustaining of the face of that knowledge or the, the upwelling of that through time is accomplished through samadhi. It's also made to penetrate the body to, to we can embody it through that non-abiding samadhi that is in unity with the, you know, what we'll call the wisdom of awakening. So samadhi becomes the vehicle for that. Pre-Kencho, post-Kencho training, we could talk about it from that standpoint, but the thread that runs through it all, or the field within which that cultivation takes place, we say is Samadhi. So I don't know if that makes sense, but the, uh, I think right from the beginning, if your practice is rightly directed, you start to have the experience of a different way of experience, of, a, of experiencing, a different way of seeing. And you start to understand, oh, this is what we mean, they mean by Samadhi, even if it's a shallow, somehow things are less rigid, somehow my uptake fixation on I, I, I is a little less. Somehow my mind's habit of seizing upon every thought and emotion that rises is less. That's, that's samadhi. We start to experience that. And as it becomes more profound, more deep and more broad, and we can put it into activities, you know, hopefully using some of the things we talked about today, we start to understand that it's transformative. Again, it's not awakening by itself, but it's, it's wonderful. It's amazing. <laughs> you know, it's a nice thing. 
And then when we have that clear awakening, we understand then how samadhi becomes the vehicle to deepen that, refine that, embody that, and sustain the face of that. Does that does that make sense at all? No, it it does it does make a lot of sense. And just to clarify, so we cultivate it technically correct in correct way. Uh, the fluid mind can be the mind that um, attention goes to different objects like thoughts, sensations, without actually getting stuck on them or we developing a more sort of expansive awareness where all those things arise and you just instead of like observing them you sorry engaging you're just like just observing from that awareness and trying to at the same time uh, function with your full might is it if i'm making sense it's it's nothing mysterious you know you you probably had the experience in your life where you were talking to someone and then maybe when we we're kids, right? You're talking to someone and then someone throws a ball at you and without thinking you catch it. The mind functions naturally, miraculously in that way. We have those kinds of experiences. Uh, the, the image we use classically for this kind of condition of mind is the thousand arm kanam, you know, the bodhisattva of compassion with thousand arms and each of the hands has a different implement in it, vajra, fan, flower, vase and so on and in the middle there's the state of complete clarity and non-abiding functioning but the arms each can miraculously do what they need to do but if kanon at some moment says oh, i wonder how the vajra is doing i think it's doing a good job all the other arms <laughs> fall apart because that's the moment of the fixation of the stopping so I, I guess in, in a daily activity, you start to look at the places where your mind gets hitched or stuck. Oftentimes an object of desire, a fantasy, or a version, a fear, something I don't like. There's a moment where the mind's sort of naturalness and freshness and uh, ability to function in that free-flowing manner contracts. You start to be able to see that. When we start to see how often that happens to us, uh, the samadhi practice, the cultivation of samadhi, is what enables us to start to, again, work with that and start to change that habit. Okay. Thank you, Mead. I hope that's helpful. It is. Uh, we have one question from Gary. Please go ahead, Gary. I think you're muted. Yeah, anyway, thank you, Medo Moroji. Uh, one one thing that I I do and that I would like maybe just uh, a brief how you integrate that is every evening I read a little something for half hour to hour before going to bed, sort of like uh, reflections or devotional sort of things. I may be struggling with something and I may have a number of books and I pick up and I look for something people say, different people say on that topic. Uh, so how do you integrate that sort of thing? Or what's your experience of integrating that sort of thing in daily practice? I mean, I don't know if it's so different from integrating anything else. Um, do it with your whole being. Right? Do it completely and read it completely and try to, you know, we have a way of reading sometimes where we're skimming the words and giving rise to our own sort of fabrications about the words, but can you, if you're reading something especially devotional or, um, I think you use the word devotional, I think of poetry, for example, can I really contact, we would call the ki, the energetic resonance or the, the essence of what the words are expressing? Of course, it's my own projection too. Right. But can I remove myself from that and just with my whole body, mind in a unified way, maybe even looking at how I hold the book, how I'm breathing, what's my condition as I'm reading? Can I have the experience that the whole room is reading or is it I'm reading that? You know, Zazen teaches us how to experience in a different way. So you can put that into reading. But the, beyond that, I would say, man, read like that's the last thing you're going to do in your life. Is those pages and and with, with the 
the joyous abandon of that guy holding his sword up. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't, I don't want people to walk around being really serious about everything they do. You know, you don't need to be really like this. But but there's a way to do things with that that, that wholeness, that whole body mind is there with it. Then I don't think it it, it can conflict or hinder your practice. Mm. Thank you. And, you know, when you're reading stuff too, it gives rise to thoughts and feelings about, you know, coming from what we're reading. And we look at that too. Look at that too. And that, that the text becomes a mirror for us too. So you can learn a lot, not only from what you're reading, but also, of course, what it starts to give rise to. You know, when I read poetry, for example, I, I all I all I see is my, I don't know, my past relationships or whatever. I, I start to see how I project my own stuff into the meaning of the words, and the more I can see that, the more I start to let go of that a little bit, and I feel like I get more from the text that was probably intended by the author <laughs> rather than putting all of my own crap on top of it. So that's an interesting practice too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lilian, I thought you raised, I think you raised your hand. I did, I, yes, I did. Thank you so much for doing this. It's beyond the beyond. Uh, could one call this uh, non-abiding or summarize this by uh, perfect relaxation? I guess so, yeah, I mean, I'm continuously amazed in practice how much I discern that it's a releasing of something rather than an adding of something. And yet the intense energetic commitment and yes, effort to arrive at that place, I have to recognize too. You know, practice, I've used this example a lot, but the practice to me is it, we don't need to make it mysterious. Sometimes there's this, I think, this conflict between so-called uh, uh, people talk about having gaining mind as if it's you know, an obstacle or people talk about, oh, you don't have enough intensity or effort in your practice. You know, there's this kind of conflict between those two camps. And I think it's a real red herring. I think it's, it's nonsense. We don't need to make it so complicated. Um, when we think of any, for example, I've used this example, a uh, marathon runner, Yes. Incredible commitment, whole body and mind thrown completely into an activity. And yet within that, the form so relaxed, so effortless and natural because the practice is at such a high level or the training is at such a high level. Right? That's to me, that's an example of how our Zen training has to be. My, I'm not going to spare myself at all if I can overcome my own inertia and laziness. I'm going to throw my whole being into training because I happen to think that's what's the best way to spend my life. But within that, there has to be a naturalness, a relaxation, a releasing, an effortlessness. And my training has to get to the level where both of those can manifest without being in conflict with one another. Otherwise, we tend to stress which of those approaches just fits our character or we prefer or we're more comfortable with. And that also is a mirror. Maybe I need to cultivate the other side. If I'm someone who's comfortable with intense effort and exhausting myself one pointedly doing something, I might need to cultivate the side that can chill out a little bit. Most people have the other problem. <laughs> they're, they're very comfortable with taking it easy. Most people need to cultivate a kind of bodily, we call ki or energy. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, they have to function like this in kufu. Kufu means there's no one way. Everything becomes our way. I, I like that that image of a marathon runner. I'm not a marathon runner, but I admire that kind of endeavor. And I think it's a, we can learn something from it. It can also be blissful then. It can also be what? Blissful. Blissful? Yes. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like more of the blissful. <laughs> I'm going to work on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one more question, Mia. 
if you allow me. Uh, regarding your talk, I'm thinking, okay, how do I really like start embodying this practice every day, right? And then you are mentioning refining the breath and, and, and the posture, but breath-wise, I, I was thinking, should we approach it from sort of a tandem, so called breath cultivation way, or more from a just observing and following your breath way? You know, more like session or more energetically, or maybe both. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, and, and I, I don't know if what I'm about to answer answers your question, so please let me know. But uh, even with my own students, there's sometimes a confusion because we have so much, or we have such a richness of breath cultivation methods that come with our lineage in Rinzai Zen. We have this thing called Tanden Soku, the breath method centered on the navel energy center. You know, we talk about that stuff a lot. And I mentioned earlier that the daily formal practice should include along with Zazen, maybe chanting to you know, five or 10 minutes a day of breath cultivation, of using those methods and, and starting to, to perfect them. Um, but that doesn't mean we become going back to Simon's point, obsessive or fixate upon the breathing. We practice those methods as exercises, but then when we do Zazen, we let it naturally soak into the Zazen. The Zazen will start to change naturally as we practice those methods outside of Zazen. Same thing in daily life. I mean, you know, we, we're we aware of what's going on in the body. If the breath comes out from, from deep uh, natural or relaxed abdominal breathing and I start to realize I'm breathing in my chest out of anxiety, I should notice that and I should change it. I should bring it back down in the way that we learn. But in general, I'm not going about my daily activity obsessing about my breathing or, or trying to work on something like Tanda and Soku. I practice Tanda and Soku, those methods, like Hakuin's Nikon, for example, is a, is a Tanda and Soku method. And then in my daily life, I start to see how my effortless or, or unconscious breathing slowly changes over time. We find eventually that with some great surprise, what well, a shape of my stomach has changed. I'm actually breathing differently than I used to. I'm not trying to, but because I'm doing that training during a, a particular time of the day, each day, the rest of the day starts to change also. So Omori Roshi said uh, uh, that the uh, error of beginners with this kind of breath cultivation is to use too much effort and strength, and that eventually it should become unconscious, almost more of a feeling than a physical usage. The way we get to that stage is by doing the rather exacting, and some, in the beginning seems difficult, practice of things like Tanda and Soku, or before that, just basic belly breathing, making sure that we're grounded in that. But then during the rest of the day, yeah, we're aware how we're breathing, but we should start to see over time that that natural unconscious way of breathing itself changes because of the practice that we do, not that we're doing the practice all day. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes sense. Uh, I can see, for example, how you may tend to keep a rounder stomach because the air is, is well, you are used to breathing deep down into the belly. But then things like closer the, closing the lower gates, do those come naturally too? Are they supposed to come naturally or we are not, we shouldn't so be concerned with that? That's, the, that's, that's what we do during the method of the practice. Right. Of Tanden Sunku, of Nikon, you know, those various things, Atwin breathing stuff that you've heard me talk about. Yeah. During daily life, I don't walk around making sure my lower gates are sealed. <laughs> right, right. And it doesn't happen no. naturally either. Or does it? The transformation will come naturally. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so okay. Got, it. got it. Our our, go our goal is not to start twenty four seven doing something that's unnatural. But what we're doing twenty four seven will change because of the practice that we do. You know the you know the old um, this old Japanese saying about the three directions at navels point. I don't want anyone to get to get obsessive about your navel right now, but there's an old saying that if your navel points downward, uh, you, you're not healthy. You need to do something about that. If your navel points straight ahead, you're a normal person. If your navel points upward, it's evidence of, that there may have been some cultivation going on. So that's why when you see like a statue of Hote or Bodhidharma, for example, 
So if, if you see ones with a belly showing in, in the iconography, the belly is usually quite round and the navel's up here, right? Because this is the belly, the navel's pointing that way. That's not just an artistic convention. That's showing something about the understanding of how to use the body. That kind of stuff is encoded in the iconography in some cases. So doesn't mean you should walk around all day trying to make your navel <laughs> point up. It means if you do this training over time, you may notice, whoa, that's weird. Something changed. My solar plexus is concave. It's soft. And the navel points up a little bit. Oh, okay. Something changed. Something shifted. And that, that's, that's, it happens organically that way. You know, when we talk about the breath cultivation, just like Zazen, we're talking about many years of practice. We don't need to be in a rush. Mm. Please, please don't walk around sealing the lower gates all day long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, well, I haven't started yet. I was planning to. Like... <laughs> awesome. Relax. Thank you, Relax. Relax. My team, one of my teachers, for instance, I always said, you know, talking about training, close your ass. But uh, other times he would say, your ass too tight. <laughs> so, <laughs> In the daily life, we should be we should be relaxed, be natural, and let the training transform us rather than try to seize on the training mm. in each moment. And Makes balance sense. that against the seemingly paradoxical instruction to attend to everything with your whole being. <laughs> yeah. awesome. This is this is, my teachers use this gesture a lot. It's not this, it's not this, it's this. So good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mayo, for the talk. It was amazing, as usual. And thank you, everybody, as well, for being here, for sharing this moment. Thank you so much.